Michael Vonnen. I'm the Tolkien Geek for the Tolkien Lore Channel, and in this video I'm going to talk a little bit about Tolkien's relationship with C.S. Lewis and how that affected each of their respective uh, literary contributions. So, of course, C.S. Lewis is uh, basically a contemporary with Tolkien. He was, I think, about six to eight years younger than Tolkien, but they knew each other quite well. They both taught at Oxford, or I want to say they both taught at Oxford. I know they uh, were in that same general academic milieu anyway. And uh, they had, they were part of the group, the larger group, which is known as the Inklings, which included several other literary care, uh, figures, including Charles Williams and a few others. And part of what these individuals did in the Inklings was they would read to each other from manuscripts that they were working on to get criticism, feedback, and that sort of thing. And because of this, you ended up with a lot of, you know, a mutual effect on each other in terms of what kind of stories they wrote, how they ended up, and that sort of thing. And Tolkien and Lewis in particular had a really unique thing come out of this because at one point, uh, Lewis and Tolkien reached an agreement that uh, they would, I think the idea was to flip a coin, but one of them would write a story on space travel and the other one would write a story on time travel. And that is the gist of what this video is going to be about. And just to warn you, there's, um, if you haven't read the Space Trilogy by uh, C.S. Lewis or some of Tolkien's works about the Silmarillion and all that stuff, there might be some spoilers in this video, so uh, you might want to check out now if you don't want to find out anything you don't already know. Okay, so how did the coin flip go? Uh, you kind of probably figured that out already because I mentioned space, the Space Trilogy by C.S. Lewis. It's not as well known as his Chronicles of Narnia series, but it's actually a um, fairly important contribution to his literary body of work. The Space Trilogy is basically a story of a guy who is kidnapped by uh, a couple of other nefarious characters and taken to Mars, and throughout that story uh, you find out kind of, it, it ends up being a sort of a, not a Christian allegory so much, but it definitely fits within the idea of C.S. Lewis's Christianity, which he kind of imparts into basically everything he writes. And the basic concept behind the series is that Earth is one of nine worlds, and the other eight are all, you know, there, there's life on all these other worlds and whatnot. The only difference is Earth is the only one where the, the chief angel, which in our case would be Satan or Lucifer, fell. All the other ones are still perfectly normal functioning worlds where the fall never happened. And that's kind of the basis for his space trilogy is that concept. And so you get angels and a lot of other things. And you get, after the, the first book takes place on Mars, the second book takes place on Venus and it's called Paralandra. And in fact, in Paralandra, the, the world is just getting started. They're, they're Adam and Eve are just having their start, and the role of the main character is to prevent a fall, which is, a, it's an interesting take on a, on, a, on a story like that. So, and then the third story is actually set on Earth and doesn't involve the main character from the first two stories as much. Now, the interesting thing about that main character, his name is Ransom. That's his last name. Um, and in a lot of ways, he is J.R.R. Tolkien. He's a, he's a professor of language or some such, and a lot of the description of what Ransom does and enjoys matches Tolkien. And um, that was, of course, intentional on Lewis's part. So, uh, but the third book takes place on Earth and is basically kind of about spiritual warfare on Earth. So it all still fits very much within that Christian theme, but it's because of this bet, or not really bet, but this deal that he had with Tolkien that these books even got written. So how did that play out on Tolkien's side? It's really interesting because Tolkien never really finished a novel 
on time travel. He did start one, but it did affect the larger body of his work in profound ways. So at first, it was going to be an Atlantis myth. He was going to have this um, character who would end up going back in time to a point right before the sinking of Atlantis, which was going to be really... I don't, I don't think the whole story was ever really completely thought through, and I'm not sure where it was going to go, but it was kind of loosely going to tie into his broader mythology of Middle Earth. But he never finished that story. So how did it end up impacting the rest of his, the rest of his work? Well, pretty profoundly, actually. So the way in which this impacted Tolkien's work is out of that story of Atlantis, we get Numenor, or Western S. Uh, if you read the books, it's often referred to as Western S because that's essentially what Numenor means in Elvish. Numenor is, of course, where Aragorn's people are from. He's, a, as Eowyn says in the movies, and, well, it's only in the extended version, so if you haven't seen that, you wouldn't have caught it. But she says that he's a descendant of Numenor, blessed with long life. Essentially what Numenor is, it's an island created by the sort of demigods who are over Middle-earth for men who helped elves in the earlier ages of Middle-earth. If you read the Silmarillion, you find out more about them, and you understand why, you know, there's, there's kind of an early division of men between the good guys and the bad guys. The elves are always, always on one side. They're always against the dark powers. Um, but the men end up being split kind of early on, and the ones that help the elves are blessed with this island, which is within sight of where the elves go, at, you know, when they leave Middle Earth, but just barely, and they're not allowed to go there, because that's not, you know, they're not immortal like elves are. They're subject to die, so, and they're also blessed with, you know, longer than average lifespan, so, uh, Numenor is Atlantis in the sense that eventually it sinks. And the reason it sinks is because men finally become corrupted partially by Sauron, who kind of worms his way in there. But the the men, the king at the last in the last days of Numenor finally gets it into his head that he's just going to try to take uh, what the elves have further to the west in the ocean. And when they try to do that, the the demigods, the Valar, as they're known in the story, uh, they call on the, the the true god of the mythology, er Eru Iluvatar, and he basically just sinks Atlantis or Numenor. And the the way Tolkien ties that together actually is he gives another name, Atalante, which of course is very similar to Atlantis. Uh, to Numenor, or I might be getting that wrong. It might be that Atalante is a word for downfall, which might, which is would be a reference to the actual downfall of Numenor. But anyway, point being, out of Numenor, there are a certain number of faithful men who are still friends with the elves, and they had ships ready to go because they knew something was going to happen. They didn't know what but they knew that the arrogance of their king was going to lead to some kind of disaster. They escaped to Middle-earth, and that's uh, they were led by Elendil and his sons Isildur and Anarion, who are the ones that end up fighting the war with Sauron that we see in the opening scenes of the Fellowship of the Ring movie. So, you know, that's where all those people come from. All the people of Gondor and the people uh, in the north, Arnor, which is where... Aragorn and his family is from, they set up two separate kingdoms, but they're all from Numenor, and they all have unnaturally long life for men. So this impacts so much of the mythology, it's, it, it's really hard to describe how it all plays out, because, of course, without Numenor, you don't have Aragorn, you don't have Gondor, you don't have all this stuff, and that's you know, if you read The Hobbit, you don't really get any idea of all that other material out there. There's this very narrow set 
of events in a very small part of the Middle Earth world, and you don't really know anything about all these broader topics, but you get to Lord of the Rings and suddenly it explodes onto the scene. There's all this other stuff out there that you, you know we didn't know about in The Hobbit, and all that history comes from the Silmarillion and the story of Numenor. So it has a huge effect on the story because it creates so many different plots and subplots. You have, uh, of course, without Numenor, you don't have Elendil and then Isildur, who takes the ring from Sauron. Uh, he works this into so many aspects of the story. And another interesting thing about the story that he, uh, a way that he works it in, is, of course, the the downfall of Numenor itself is in part uh, based on his own dream, recurring dream, actually, of a great wave coming over the land and, and destroying destroying the land, which he, as I've mentioned in another video, he kind of bequeaths that dream to Faramir, and in one of his letters, in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, he mentions the fact that after he kind of wrote about his dream in fiction, he kind of stopped having it, which is interesting. So, uh, and by the way, I'll link to the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien if you want to re read that in the description. But, um, so, I mean, you get a huge amount of story and plot and character information that just wouldn't exist but for this, you know, original deal between Lewis and Tolkien about who's going to write a, a time travel story and who's going to write a space travel story. And it just, you know, it turns out we never got the time travel story, which is a shame. I would love to have seen what Tolkien would have done with that. It would have been really interesting to see how he would have played that in, if he would have connected it to his, you know, his Silmarillion mythology, or if he would have left it unconnected and just made it more straight-up Atlantis myth. Um... But we'll never know unless, you know, Christopher Tolkien is still publishing stuff from uh, Tolkien's writings as of 2016. So, you know, maybe one day we'll get lucky. I mean, there's there's parts of that story that have made it into the History of Middle Earth series. but And so I don't think it's likely we'll ever see much more of it. But here's holding out hope, I guess. So, anyway, that's the interesting thing about Lewis and Tolkien's relationship that I wanted to talk about in this video. If you've got any uh, other interesting points about how this played out, or if you'd like to hear more about Tolkien and Lewis's relationship, leave a comment. If you'd like to learn more about Tolkien generally, or his works, then subscribe to the channel, or follow me at uh, on Twitter at J-R-R-T Lore. That's J-R-R-T for J-R-R Tolkien, of course. So uh, hopefully you'll follow me one of those two ways. Until next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek for Tolkien Lore. Namariye. No